slide down. Alrighty. Let us keep going. All right, so we're getting towards now rotational dynamics uh, based on what we were doing with kinematics. So let's review. You have a spinning disc. Maybe it's a CD or a Blu-ray or something. It's initially spinning clockwise as it appears on this page or the screen and is slowing down. The vectors omega and alpha point both into the screen, out of the screen, Omega points into the screen while alpha points out of the screen, that's answer C, or D, omega points out of the screen and alpha points into the screen. So in this case, I would think that, okay, if the spin is clockwise, then I need to be able to take my right hand and my fingers and curl it so that they also curl in the clockwise direction. I can only do that if my thumb is pointing into the screen. So I would say that omega points into the page, so that makes it either A or C. But now we know that the object is slowing down. And thinking back to regular kinematics, we know that if an object is slowing down, that suggests the acceleration is in the opposite direction as the velocity. In this case, that must suggest that alpha is in the opposite direction as omega. So if omega is into the page, into the screen, alpha better be pointing out of the screen. Because of torques from the moon, the Earth's rotation is slowing down. It's actually true, uh, but by like you know, minuscules of a second each year. The vectors omega and alpha both point along the north pole, along the south pole. Omega points towards the north pole, alpha points towards the south pole, or the flip. So in this case, based on how the earth is drawn on the screen, if I have my fingers curl around in the same direction as that gray arrow is pointing, then my finger seems to be pointing towards the North Pole. So I'd say that Omega points towards the North Pole. And therefore, if it is slowing down, Alpha must point in the opposite direction. Alpha must be pointing towards the South Pole. A waiter continuously pushes open the door from the kitchen into the restaurant. The re resulting vectors, Alpha and Omega, point in which directions? And I suppose we have not yet done torque, so the interpretation of by continuously pushes means that the door should be accelerating open as it, rot it should be rotating faster and faster. And the hinge, right, the door opens on this side, so the hinge or the rotation axis is on the left side. So in this case, the door is going to swing open towards us. So if I want to put my thumb along the hinge of the door and have my fingers curl in such a way such that swings open, that the door swinging open is in the same direction as my fingers are curling, then I have to have omega pointing down towards the floor. We could also do this from the point of view of the waiter who's coming through the door on the other side. In that case, you know, they will still agree that omega points downward, but they are, you know, you think the fingers are pushing the door open with the hinge then on their right side. And since it is accelerating, uh, then alpha must be pointing in the same direction. So in this case, they are both towards the uh, floor. All right, good. So we left off last time thinking about what is the analogy for mass in rotational motion. And we came up with this thing called the rotational inertia or the moment of inertia. And we got about it thinking of if we wanted to rewrite kinetic energy in terms of rotational variables for motion that is pure rotation. We did this for discrete objects and came up with an expression for this rotational inertia is that I take the sum of all the particles in the system 
multiply by the square of the perpendicular distance from the, um, the rotation axis. So you draw a line that is 90 degrees from omega or from the rotation axis, whatever that is. And that line that is at a 90 degree angle pointing to what your little piece of mass or your ball or whatever the object is, that is the distance you use. And then if it's a continuous mass, uh, that uh, becomes an integral. Ultimately, all of these can be written, all any moments of inertia or rotational uh, inertias. Usually in the problem, there is some characteristic mass, which is the total mass, and there's some characteristic size in the problem. Like if it's a sphere, the, si the characteristic variable is the radius. If it's a cylinder, usually the characteristic variables are, might be the radius and the height. You know, for a hoop, it might be the radius again. Uh, for a box, it might be, you know, if it's a square box, it might be the length of one side. And so you can always write these in terms of some number times the total mass times the square of this char characteristic length. And we saw that, you know, with the ones that are given in your book. But for the hoop, there's really only one length scale in this problem, which is the radius. There's no widths or thicknesses or anything else. There's only one, one thing that has units of length. R. And so the a moment of inertia should be the total mass of the hoop times R squared, and then maybe there's a number out front. In this case, there actually is no number out front. As opposed to, say, the thin rod, where the characteristic length in the problem is the length of the rod. We're assuming it's thin, so there's no radius, there's no thickness, there's nothing else that, have, that has units of um, meters or length or whatnot. So we should anticipate that the rotational inertia should be the mass of the rod times the square of the length of the rod. And there might be some number out front. In this case, it is 1 12th times the mass of the rod times the length of the rod. Similarly for the sphere, right? the radius plays the characteristic role. So it's m r squared with some number. Same thing for a shell, a hoop, you know, rods, slabs. So this can be important uh, because this gives us another form of energy that we can write down. When there is kinetic motion, motion of moving, that moving could be because the object is moving from point A to point B, a sliding box, a wheel that is actually going somewhere, you know, an airplane through the sky. There is some translational motion. And we've learned that we can write that the kinetic energy of the system, be it the airplane, you know, the ball, whatever it is, we can write that as one half the total mass of the system times its center of mass velocity. That gives us a sense of the kinetic energy of the entire system. The system is made up of multiple parts. You could, of course, add up all the one half mv squareds of all the individual parts. Uh, I'll leave it as an exercise for you can see it. You can show that that all essentially amounts to being one half the total mass times the center of mass velocity squared. So that is motion, actual motion translating from point A to point B. You could have rotation, that is, or you could have motion rather, that is just pure rotation. The object is not necessarily going anywhere, uh, but it's nonetheless moving. There is still kinetic energy here because the object is moving. Uh, in which case you might be able, you can associate a kinetic energy with rotation where in this case it's rotating about the center of mass is the assumption if you want to write it down like this. And in this case you could actually break up the kinetic energy so that you have the, mo the motion, the kinetic energy of the motion, its actual movement, and then any sort of rotation about the center of mass. And I think I've, allu I've alluded to that before. As another p part of review, thinking of, say, a wheel or a ball rolling, you might say, what about, but sometimes you might think that these two terms are connected to one another. If a wheel is rolling down across the room or a ball is rolling across the room, it has both rotational motion and it's moving. The center of mass is moving. Uh, and you're right. In that case, for those sorts of scenarios, then these terms are connected to one another. And the way I might connect them is identifying that the center of mass for rolling, and your book goes into this in the next chapter, but I don't think we're going to cover it in detail, uh, but you can read ahead if you want to. 
when an object is rolling uh, like a bicycle wheel, like a, like a ball on the ground. Rolling has certain requirements so that it's actually rolling versus, say, a bicycle wheel that is sliding across the ground. Uh, and the requirement is, is that the center of mass velocity of the entire wheel is simply related uh, to the angular variables in the problem, uh, like what we saw before, that the center of mass velocity is just omega times the radius of the wheel. If you think about this, you know, for, for a simple wheel that's rolling, nothing crazy is going on, there's no skidding, there's nothing like that. Um, you could imagine I could take a bicycle wheel and I could paint the entire tire with some paint and keeping, and keeping the, the, the paint wet. I could then roll the wheel across the ground. As the wheel rolls, the wet paint will leave its mark on the ground and a line will be drawn out. Um, so it makes sense that as the wheel, when the wheel makes one full rotation, it has covered one circumference length and distance, because you would see a line that is exactly equal to the circumference of the bicycle wheel, because the entire circumference of the bicycle wheel has now just left a line of paint across the ground. So the rate at which the wheel is moving is also matched by the weight rate that it's rotating, so that the center mass velocity is just omega r. So in that case, you could, for example, for a, ro a rotating wheel, write down an expression. I'll drop the center of mass. Right, This omega squared here is really just v over r squared. So there is a relationship, you know, there's a there's an m, there's a v, and it's, they're kind of in both terms. Remember that i in this case, you know, k I could write as one half m total v squared plus one half. And i is some number k, I don't quite know what it is. I have to, you know, if it's a sphere, it's a different number. We said that's what all these are. You know, if it's a sphere, it's a different number. If it's a rod, it's a different number, but it's some number k, little k times mr squared, that's the moment of inertia, and then v over r, all squared. And let's see, uh, some things already start to simplify. There's an r squared here, there's an r squared here, there's a one half m on bo in both. This becomes, let's see, one half m, then there's a v squared, and then it looks like here there's a k v squared. So actually I could factor it out even more. I guess right, this is one half m one plus k v squared or something like that. Yes. So, so that the total kinetic energy is not just motion, but it's also rotating about the center of mass. So you could ask yourself, like if you have a ramp and you release a spherical ball that then rotates down the hill. And then I take, say, a cylinder and let that rotate down uh, the ramp. And suppose they both are roughly the same size and they have the same mass. Do they both get down to the bottom of the ramp at the same time? So you could ask which gets to bottom of ramp. Now you might be thinking they get to the bottom of the ramp at the same at the same time. Didn't we just do a whole unit on conservation of energy where we could say that mgh equals one half mv squared at the bottom? If it turns total potential into total uh, kinetic. And if this were a box sliding, this would be exactly correct. I've been trying to be careful this semester and always say sliding down a ramp, never have anything actually rolling down a ramp, because rolling is slightly different than sliding. Sliding is just the box is physically moving, it's only translating. Where with rotation, it's, all, it's not only moving down the ramp, but it's rotating as well. So there is energy that is associated with the fact that the ball is spinning or that the cylinder is spinning. So I would not say uh, conservation of energy mgh equals one half mv squared. 
I would say instead mgh equals one half mv squared and then we derived it was one plus k where k is whatever that number is in front of the rotational inertia value you know one over twelve or I think it was one for the hoop one over twelve for the rod and you know, two fifths for a sphere so here then notice that since k is different for different shapes different shapes uh, end up at the bottom with different amounts of rotational and uh, translational kinetic energy. All right, so here's the, here's the question to you in the movie we shall watch. Walter Lewin, famous physicist at MIT, uh, also has a set of Physics One lectures on uh, YouTube that are pretty well respected. Has a two cylinders. Identical cylinders in mass and radius, except one is hollow and one is solid. And the question is, and he's going to release them at the top together. And the question is, which makes it to the bottom first? So cast your votes. Does the hollow cylinder make it to the bottom first? Or does the solid cylinder make it to the bottom first? Maybe I'll even put this up real quick to uh, assist. Uh, I will point out also that a hollow cylinder has the same moment of inertia as a hoop. So this is one moment of inertia for the hollow cylinder, and then the solid cylinder is uh, this one. Is that true? Yes. Which, notice, also doesn't depend on the length. Kind of an interesting symmetric uh, relationship with cylinders. Okay, let us see. So in this case, if I wanted to look, I would say, okay, the rotational inertia for the solid cylinder is one half mR squared, where for the hollow cylinder, it's just mR squared. So this one has a higher rotational inertia than this one for the same mass. All the mass is farther away from the rotational axis that, oh, I almost gave the answer away. Let's look. Oh, it's that. Blah, 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 I don't care, yada, yada. All right, so here we go. I guess we should see what it is. Uh, I think he's putting the hollow cylinder towards the screen and the solid cylinder is away from the screen. Three, two, one, zero. The hollow one <laughs> will always lose. Watch it again. Hollow towards the screen, solid farther away from the screen. Three, two, one, zero. The hollow one <laughs> will always lose. And why is that, Walter Lewin? Uh, because the hollow one has a higher rotational inertia. Um, more of that potential energy gets turned into rotation. Um, which leaves less of it to become actual translational motion. Uh, versus with a solid cylinder, there's less energy that has to go into rotation, and as a result, um, more of it is left for translational motion. The hollow one always loses. Also notice I used conservation of energy to make this argument. It's not like conservation of energy disappears. Uh, it still applies with rotational motion uh, if you incorporate rotational energy as just its own term. It's a, an additional kind of kinetic energy. It goes along with everything we saw before with kinetic energy. And this rotation can be very important. Um, the uh, Crab Nebula, uh, the result of a supernova going off, exploding, and the remnants of a star kind of get are being ejected into space at thousands of miles per hour. In the very center of this object is a small, tiny, compact uh, neutron star. That neutron star is incredibly rapidly rotating, re rotating multiple times a second, you know, versus the Earth, which rot rotates once every 24 hours, versus the Sun, which rotates once a month. 
uh, these neutron stars are rotating you know, multiple times a second. There's an incredible amount of rotational kinetic energy in, in the neutron star. That rotational energy, because of torques, which we're about to talk about, um, torques sl are slightly slowing down the neutron star. We can see this happening. When we look at uh, X-ray images, for example, really, really close uh, near the center of the Crab Nebula, we see the compact object. And then we see uh, radiation essentially coming off of um, the neutron star. That energy to create radiation, you will learn in physics three, light, radiation, radio waves, infrared waves, X-rays, gamma rays, all those are just all the all a kind of the same thing, electromagnetic radiation. That takes energy. Energy is needed to create electromagnetic radiation and to send out electromagnetic radiation. And so by energy conservation, that electromagnetic radiation has to come from somewhere. And we can see that this neutron star is ever, 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 ever so slightly slowing down, slowly but surely, with time. And if we do the energy conservation problem, you, you can show that the incredibly slight amount of change in the rotation period of the central neutron star can explain all of this radiation you're seeing right here that tiny little change in the period, since there is so much rotational energy in that neutron star, it only has to slow down ever so slightly to give away an incredible abundance of energy, which through other processes get turns into radiation and light and create something like this. Um, and that radiation is being intercepted and absorbed by all this gas, which is all this kind of filamentary webby things that you see, which is then kind of pushing forth uh, the ejected stellar material into space. So rotational energy is nonetheless legit, um, as a legit form of energy. Let me quickly do an example of the parallel axis theorem. Your book proves it, um, so I'll let you just read the book uh, in terms of the proof, if you're curious about the proof. Let's go back to this slide. These rotational inertias are all derived with a particular rotation axis in mind. We've talked about this, how rotational inertia depends on the rotation axis. You specify the rotation axis that the object is going to rotate about, uh, and then you can calculate the rotational inertia based on that axis. In particular, these are all derived with the rotational axis going through the center of mass of the system. But you might be wondering, what if I wanted to calculate the rotational axis, like take the sphere, for example. In this case, what's on the screen is showing it with the rotational axis through the center of the sphere. But perhaps you wanted, uh, I guess where's my soccer ball? I've lost my soccer ball. Oh, there it is. You know, I could ask instead of say, you know, if this is the rotation axis, instead of having it go through the center of, of the of the soccer ball so that it could spin say, you know, like, like this. What if I wanted to move the rotation axis so it wasn't in the center, but it was actually like right here. So then the soccer ball would be kind of doing this sort of thing. It would be rotating as around a new rotation axis. Or I could put the rotation axis here. And in this case, that would be the soccer ball going around this sort of rotation. Um, do I have to do the integral all over again? You could. That would actually, that would still work, of course. You could always do the integral or redo the integral. Um, right, dm r squared. But now you're measuring your r squared from a new rotation axis that has shifted uh, compared to where it was when you did it for the center of mass. Uh, those sorts of integrals can get 
you know, the integrals for the set at the center of mass are complicated enough. Uh, these shifts uh, can become even more challenging. Luckily, as your book um, shows, there is a trick that you can do um, where you can shift the rotation axis and as a result immediately derive the new rotational inertia without having to do the new integral all over again. And so this is the parallel axis theorem where I can calculate my new rotational inertia based off my old rotational inertia if I just simply add to it the total mass multiplied by the distance of the shift. So if I wanted to uh, take my rotation axis and move it over to the edge of the ball, I am shifting it essentially, I'm shifting it a length of equal to the radius of the ball. I'm starting here, I'm ending here. I've shifted it over in some direction by the radius of the ball in this case. Uh, so I could take this rotational inertia and calculate the rotational inertia when this is the rotation axis by adding to it the mass of the ball times the radius of the ball squared in that case. Let's actually do that. Uh, let's see, so for the ball, uh, it looks like solid sphere about any diameter. Um, the rotational inertia is two-fifths mass of the ball radius of the ball squared. So if I then want to shift the rotation axis like I've drawn like I've drawn up here, you know, let me redraw the old one for comparison. So old, new. The shift that I made was I shifted it over a length h, but in this case the length h is just the radius of the sphere. So in this case I would say the new rotational inertia is two-fifths mr squared plus m total r squared in this case. H, play, h has the value of the radius of the sphere. Uh, two-fifths plus one equals seven-fifths m r squared. And then if I wanted to do a problem where the ball was rotating about that new rotation axis, this is my rotational inertia. Remember that rotational inertia always depends on where your uh, rotation axis is. If you want to do a different sort of rotation problem, you have to recalculate what the rotational inertia is for that rotational axis. You know, another problem, for example, um, we did this last time, uh, but we can do it again in two different ways and see that the, um, the parallel axis theorem works. You know, suppose this is my rotation axis, where it's a rod that we will say is so, so thin we don't have to worry about the mass of the rod, and there are two balls on the end of the, of the rod, like a baton. In this case, the rotational inertia is 2m r squared, if each of these is a distance r. You add up m r squared for each, you get 2m r squared. Now suppose I shifted the rotational axis here. So now this is a distance 2r with m and m. Since it's just two balls, I could just do it the old way and just add up mr squared for both. Um, so I would do the mass of the ball on the left-hand side times the square of the distance it is from the rotation axis. So that's 2r all squared. And then the mass on the right times the distance it's from the rotation axis, which is 0 squared. So in this case, this is 4mr squared. I could have also done it using the parallel axis theorem, saying that m nu, or i nu rather, is i old plus the total mass of the system, 2m, multiplied by the distance that I shifted the rotation axis by, which in this case is r squared. 
So in that case, the old value is 2mr squared. I'm saying add to that 2mr squared. You indeed get 4mr squared back, which is what we expected. We want these two to agree, and they do. We found the same answer in two different ways. Now with balls not on rods, uh, this is a little bit more involved, which is why the parallel axis theorem can be useful for uh, these sorts of problems. If you are, if you have identified a new rotational axis, um, or maybe you want to shift this, the rotation axis in some way, uh, you can do it. You know, for the example, the hoop. You know, we had the case where we just were rotating the hoop like this, and that had a certain rotational inertia. In this case, it's the one in the upper, in the upper left, m r squared, where my fist is the rotation axis. But if I wanted to then shift the rotation axis up by the radius of the circle so that I could instead uh, analyze this sort of motion. Same hoop, but different rotational inertia. Um, I could calculate the new rotational inertia um, by taking mr squared in the upper left corner, shifting it by the total mass m times the distance I shifted, which is again the radius squared, so in that case, it would just become mr squared shifting up. The inertia would become 2mr squared. The dynamics of rotation. For linear motion, we had this thing called force. Forces caused accelerations, which caused things to start moving, change direction, etc. The analogous thing in rotational motion is going to be what is called torque, uh, which of course relates to forces. Everything relates to forces. We could always do F equals MA for anything. Uh, but like we saw with conservation, if we are clever about what sorts of things we're looking at, be it momentum or energy, they have certain properties that we can use that are, you know, in that case, where conservation laws could be obeyed. Torque allows for a simplified sort of notation that allows us to better understand how uh, to explain rotational motion, motion that is just the cause of rotation. So rotation, you know, we've seen, you've seen this before, you know, with a wrench, you know, you, in order to crank a wrench, you have to, you know, if you have some screw, which will just be my finger, um, with your other hand, you know, or your hand on the wrench, you can crank the screw so that it rotates a certain amount. And we could start to think, just try to get our intuition um, in the right spot. Where and how do we get the maximum amount of rotation for a given force that's applied? This will still come down to forces. It's not like forces are going to disappear. To crank a wrench, you have to apply a force to the wrench in order to make it turn. And then that then the wrench then applies a force to the screw, and the screw rotates. So what is the best way to get the most bang for your buck if you're trying to get something to rotate? That is the idea behind torque. So if we go to the other camera, this camera, let's see, might be easier for me to demonstrate this. Um, if I have some hypothetical little thing that's going to represent the screw, the idea if I want to get the screw to rotate, you know, how, what do I have to do in order to get the wrench itself to move and then also rotate the screw along with it? So maybe I'll even grab an arrow to represent our force. So rotation, if I want to think of what rotation looks like, rotation might look something like it rotates, uh, from my point of view at least, counterclockwise. In that case, by the right-hand rule, I would expect that if the thing is to rotate counterclockwise, I'm creating a vector omega that points out of the table, in this case. How do I achieve such a rotation? By applying a force to the wrench. One way I could think of it is I could just apply a force directly onto the wrench, 
pointing in the same direction along the, the length of the wrench itself. So there's this distance here that will correspond to the length of the wrench. The distance from where I'm applying the force, which might be here, might be here, might be here, wherever I'm touching and pushing and pulling on the wrench, uh, as a distance from what's what we want to get rotating, and then the direction that I'm applying the force uh, onto the wrench. Let's stick with this outer end here. So I could apply just the force directly parallel to the length of the wrench. And if I were to do that, so essentially I'm just pushing on the wrench into the screw. I think we can all agree that that is not how you're going to get the wrench rotating. I'm just pushing on the screw in that case. Similarly, I could pull um, if this is if we define some vector that goes from the this guy here to where I'm applying the force and call that that's actually it's called the moment arm of the wrench uh, and if I apply my force anti-parallel to that in this case I am just pulling the wrench away from the screw that is not going to cause any sort of rotation I'm just then pulling the wrench away if this were you know attached on all ends like this you know, pulling it away from the screw, I would just be tugging on the screw. But nothing about what I'm doing here would cause any sort of rotation as a result. So again, if we define the length of the wrench or the distance to where I'm applying the force as the moment arm of the wrench, we have just shown that, do, that pulling or pushing on the wrench parallel to that, to that moment arm does nothing in terms of getting it to rotate. In that case, it just resulted in the wrench being pulled away from the screw or resulted in me just pushing on the screw without any resulting rotation. I could think, okay, if parallel doesn't work, what about perpendicular? You know, what if I applied a force like this? So the wrench is here, the moment arm goes out to here, and I'm applying a force perpendicular to this length. I'm going now in the, this direction. In that case, you know, if I always stick in the same direction, in that case indeed, if I apply a force that results in the wrench starting to twist, there is a twisting motion that results. And in this case, it results in a clockwise, at least from my point of view, rotation um, as I apply the force. Similarly, if I were to apply the force uh, still perpendicular but in the opposite direction, the force I'm applying, I'm pushing on the wrench in the direction of the arrow, it again would cause the wrench to rotate as a result. I could apply the force at a different location. I could apply a force not all the way out on the edge of the wrench, but maybe only halfway around. And if I apply a force, there's still a resulting rotation that takes place but it might be a different amount. We will get to that. You know, it could be really close in, in which case I could push on the wrench and it could, there can be a resulting rotation as a result. But if I do it parallel, or if I do it anti-parallel, then nothing happens, no rotation occurs. You know, I could also do it at some sort of weird angle. You know, I apply a force out here, but I'm not doing it perpendicular, but I'm doing it, you know, it has a little bit of both. In which case, rotation still may occur as a result. Thinking back to our ideas of vector decomposition, um, it might be obvious in this case that, that in this case, this arrow has a parallel component, a, a component that points along the wrench, and then a perpendicular component, a, a component that points perpendicular to the direction, the length, the arm of the wrench. And we're getting to a clear picture that it seems like it's the perpendicular push or pull. You know, I could pull it in this way, you know, on the edge. If I were to pull it, it would still rotate as a result. So it seems that in the case of rotation, when I have something like a wrench that has some sort of moment arm, it is the perpendicular force that matters. Uh, not the parallel or not the anti-parallel, but anything that is perpendicular or has a perpendicular component, like, you know, a vector at an angle that can result in rotational motion uh, through the result of something that we will call torque. And it seems like it may depend, you, know, you would think that it should depend on where you apply the force. If I apply the force very close to the screw, the resulting motion is quite different 
than if I apply the same amount of force at the very outer edge of the screw, or the wrench rather. So there are two variables to keep in mind here. There seems to be the length, you know, the distance away from the screw that we apply this force, and the and the force itself. You know, I guess I guess there's three things: the length of where we apply the force, the magnitude of the force that we apply, and the angle at which we're applying it. You know, these can all affect the resulting rotational motion that we observe. And we will see that that then results, that is an analogous way of how we define forces with rotation. So let me redraw it over here. So let's see how good I am at drawing screws. All right, so I have some screw There's a wrench that is around that screw, and some force is being applied. Maybe I'll apply the force here, and it points in some direction. That's the force I'm applying. It causes the screw to rotate, so this here acts as the rotation axis. You can know, think, what is the screw rotating around? You can imagine a line that goes into and out of the screen that that screw is rotating around. And the other thing we will need is that there's some distance from the rotation axis. I'll call it R, which is the distance from the axis of rotation to F. Uh, which we will call the moment arm. And we saw that if the force was parallel to the moment arm or anti-parallel to the moment arm, no rotation occurred. And it seemed like when the force was closer to being perpendicular to the moment arm, then rotation occurred. So let us define torque. Um, oops, as a twisting action. Of some applied force. And we will define it to have a magnitude. So usually lowercase tau is used for torque. So it will have a magnitude equal to the force applied, this moment arm, R. And there's going to be some angle that's applied. And we can think of this that this um, is similar but not quite the same as work. Where work we, we cared about a force applied over a distance, but really it was only the part that was parallel or anti-parallel that mattered. In this case, there's a force applied at a given location, a distance from the moment arm, but it's only the perpendicular component that mattered. So we define this as fr sine of theta where theta here is the angle between F and R. So to redraw the picture, you know, suppose some force is applied right here at the edge of the edge of the wrench. That's F. There is some axis of rotation, which is here. And then I can define my moment arm as the distance from that axis of rotation to where the force is being applied. I call that R. Notice in this case, if I were to redraw the force, the, the vectors, there is a force vector that's going in this direction, and there is a moment arm that's going in this direction.
you know, I might define this angle here as the angle between the two, the angle between the two vectors. Similar to the dot product, it is the smallest angle between the two that is less than, 100, less than or equal to 180 degrees. Uh, so that would define the angle theta in this case. Or again, you can think of it just as, uh, if you want to think of it just as the magnitude of tau is the moment arm and then the magnitude of f times sine of theta, which you can think of as the moment arm r multiplied by, I'll call this f perpendicular. The component of the force perpendicular to the moment arm. I'm only caring about, it's only the perpendicular component that is causing any rotation to occur. The parallel component just shoves the wrench onto the screw or pulls it off the screw. It is only the part that is perpendicular to that moment arm, the length of the wrench in this case. Uh, that matters. So also notice that the value of the torque, something that's going to measure how much rotation occurs, changes if I change where I apply the force. If I apply the force now instead halfway down the wrench, then the moment arm is defined as only this length here, R. Not the full length of the wrench, but just in this case it looks like about half the wrench. In that case, the torque measured might be something quite different. Um, even if I kept the force the same and just did it at different locations, that uh, results in a different amount of torque. Which is also why something like this, it is easier for you to rotate you know, and twist a, a screw with a larger wrench like this compared to something like this, uh, which has a longer possible moment arm. I can only go out this far if, you know, if anywhere. Um, I could go closer, of course, but if I wanted to get the longest moment arm to increase my torque, uh, I can only go out this far compared to a wrench like this, which I can go out much, much farther. I can get, you know, almost it looks like about twice, I can get twice the torque for the same amount of force because the moment arm is twice as long. And I have a video that makes that a little clear about why where you apply the force matters. So I made this uh, yesterday. So the idea here is that I took my off, I went outside my office, closed my door. In the door, you can see there's the door handle here, which m means the door is attached to the wall over here. This dashed line represents the, where the hinges are. That is where the door is allowed to rotate from. So that dashed line represents the axis of rotation. That is where the door is rotating around when pushed or opened or whatever. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just give a, a, uh, a, a slap to the door. And I'm gonna do it as a slap so that I can always do, I can convince myself I'm applying roughly the same amount of force for my two different experiments. Or I'm going to give the same slap uh, near the outside of the door where the handle is and then in another location near the uh, very close to the rotation axis and we can see what happens by looking at how the door appears to swing open. So here it's closed. I'm going to give a push. All right, my screen temporarily froze so I don't know if it did for you too. So let's redo that. I'm going to give a push the door swings open. That arrow represents the moment arm I gave in that case. Let's backtrack and see. Do, do, do. Right. My hand was all the way out here from the rotation axis. I gave it a push. In that case, it appeared like the door swung open. Now let's do the same experiment, but I'm going to push somewhere like right here, very close to the rotation axis with the same just kind of slap. So same amount of force, but different moment arm. 
In that case, the door barely moves at all. We can do both of them back to back again. Long moment arm. And same force, but closer to the rotation axis, smaller moment arm. Much less rotation in that case. Which is why door handles are on the opposite side of the door, because when you're pushing the door open, you want to maximize the torque that you're applying to the door, else you have to end up really shoving on the door in order to get it to budge. Uh, you want that long moment arm to help you out in that case. <laughs> All right, so if we wanted to be a little bit more quantitative, we could say torque. What have we learned about torque? Now we are working towards a quantitative definition here. We are working towards how we can then get write down some numbers and how it could give us, say, something like an angular acceleration. Uh, but conceptually, we could say um, torque. Or it depends on three things that I outlined before. The moment arm. Or I could write that as the distance from the rotation axis or pivot point or whatever. Uh, the magnitude of the force applied. Then as well as the direction the force is applied. where perpendicular to the moment arm is preferred. I know I noticed my screen just went away. Technology is just not on my side today. You might have noticed I suddenly changed shirts and shaved. Um, uh, that was not by design. That was because my computer crashed and then I gave up on Friday and then came back here on Saturday to record it again. Uh, but luckily I was able to recover uh, what I had done on Friday. <laughs> right, so the way we define torque, um, torque is also a vector. You know, I wrote it above as lowercase tau with a little arrow sign. Uh, torque has a direction associated with it. Another way of defining torque is through what's called the cross product. When we did work energy, we saw that there was this thing called the dot product, which allowed you to define a way of multiplying two vectors together. There was a way to do it computationally, and geometrically it was interpreted as the length of the distance times the component of the force that was parallel or anti-parallel to that distance, you know, F, R, cosine theta. The cross product, we define it or we write it as, uh, in the case of torque, we write it as, it has to include some information about the moment arm, where you are applying the force, as well as the force itself, as well as the angle between them. So we can write it as R, then a cross or a multiply sign, the force vector. So not a dot, the dot was the dot product. This is the cross product. And the cross product is defined such that the magnitude of the cross product is exactly what we wrote above. The moment arm times the magnitude of the force times the sine of the angle between them.
There is also a computational way to write down the, the cross product. It is a mess. Um, we will only need the geometric version, the fact that the magnitude of the torque is RF sine theta. Uh, if you are curious, um, usually you do not see this until like a Calc 3 course. Uh, if you have vectors A, which is AX, AY, AZ, and then you have vector B, which is BX, BY, BZ, Again, we will not need this, so um, I can say A cross B, if I wanted to write that down, um, unlike the dot product, the cross product returns a vector. Notice what I wrote above. I said the torque vector equals R cross F. Before, with the dot product, the dot product took two vectors in and gave a scalar out, a number out. The cross product is a little different in that you t put two vectors in, but you get a vector out. And that vector can be calculated, um, but it is not exactly uh, the prettiest looking expression. Uh, nope, that is wrong. So the first term is AYBZ minus AZBY. The second term is AZBX minus AXBZ. And then the third term is AX, BX, nope, AX, BY minus AY, BX. Which, boy, um, that would give you not only, that would have, you can show that has a magnitude that is still equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle between them. Uh, but this actually gives you the actual vector itself. Uh, which again, we will not need. We will need that the magnitude of the torque is the magnitude, the product of their magnitudes times the sine of the angle between them. But we will not necessarily need to do the computational calculation. But I will write that down as optional for funsies. Now, since torque is a vector, there needs to be a way that I can specify the direction that the vector points. While we might not need to evaluate the cross product mess I just wrote at the bottom, a vector is defined as a magnitude having a magnitude and a direction. So if torque is R cross F, where the magnitude is the magnitude of R, the magnitude of F times the sine of theta, what is the direction? of the torque vector. And in this case, the right-hand rule again applies. So it's determined again by the right-hand rule. And the way that's easiest for me to, to remember this is uh, the following steps. One. Point your right hand fingers in the direction of R. So just straight, you know, your hand is kind of straight out, just point your fingers in the direction of R, whatever that vector is pointing in. Curl your fingers so that they then point in the direction of F. So if my fingers are, so if I have, you know, if F is pointing this way and R is pointing this way, I might start by first pointing my fingers in the direction of R, then curling my fingers so that they then point in the direction of F. So it might be the case where I can't do that unless I flip my hand around. You know, there's only for for any two angles there is a obvious way to curl my fingers that doesn't require me to break my wrist. In order to curl my right hand fingers so that it starts pointing in the direction of R, then ends up pointing in the direction of F. Now 
your thumb then points in the direction of tau or r crossed f. So let's do an example or two. Right. Suppose here's R and then here's F. You know, I guess I could have had a step zero, which is draw the vectors um, emerging from the same point. So I guess draw F and R emerging from a point. Yeah, so actually let me do let me motivate that step as well. All right, suppose I have a screw and a wrench again. You know, and I apply a force in this direction, but then the moment arm is is here. So this is R, this is F. My first step would be to redraw it so that they're emerging from a point. So R was going towards the right, and then F was going like this. Then in that case, I start just staring at my screen. I start by taking my right hand and pointing all my fingers. My fingers are just all straight in a line with my thumb pointed out. And I point my fingers all along the direction, the same direction as capital R. And then without moving my hand, I curl my fingers so that they point then in the direction of F. And I can do that, you know, with my hand like this. I can curl so my hand kind of curls like at 100 degrees or so. My fingers can curl easily 100 degrees. Since I can do that, I then look at my thumb and see my thumb is pointing out of the screen. So in this case, I would say R cross F points... out of page or screen or whatever. So out of screen, I would say torque points out of the screen. Same thing, but suppose I apply a force that's straight down halfway out. So in that case, there is some moment arm that goes out to that point where I'm applying the force, and there's some force F that's straight down. I would first start by saying, okay, here was R, here was F. Now in this case, um, see, maybe I can't really do it you know, towards you on the screen. Um, but I could start by I realize I just lost my screen again. I realize I could start by pointing my fingers out along the direction of R. Uh, and then I can... I'm seeing if I can get the mirroring back. Right, I can point them along the direction of R, but if I draw it like this, I can't sweep my hands up because the force is pointing downwards. So what I have to do instead is I have to flip my hand around, then point my fingers in the direction of R, and then I can curl my fingers to point straight down. And as a result, my thumb points into the screen, or into the page in that case, rather than out of the screen, out of the page. So in that case, I would say that um, the torque, uh, it's still, you know, the magnitude of the torque is still the magnitude of the force, the magnitude of the moment arm, and then the angle between them. But in this case, the direction of that force points not uh, into the screen, but out of the screen. There, I have my screen back. So in this case, torque points into the screen. All right, good. Uh, so we're trying, we're quantitatively um, trying to get a feel for what, how we could define torque. Some things to note that 
unlike the dot product, you know, while a dot b equaled b dot a, a cross b does not equal b cross a. And how can we see this? You know, I could take some vector a and some vector b. A cross B, based on the rules that was above on the page, says I first start with my fingers pointed along A, and then I curl them to B. In that case, I would say that the torque points, or the cross product rather, points out of the screen. B cross A says I start with my fingers pointed along B, and then curl them to then point along the direction of A. In that case, my thumb has to point into the screen, into the page. Now their magnitudes are the same, but their directions are flipped. So the true relationship is that um, A cross B is the opposite of B cross A. They have the same magnitude, it's still just the magnitude of A, the magnitude of B, the sign of the angle between them, that doesn't change no matter what the ordering is. But the direction that the vector points does change. That's just math. Physically, it makes sense that you start along the moment arm and then point along the direction of the force. It's R cross F. Because that is ultimately telling you you're, you're essentially the rotation is going to want to follow the direction that F is pointing. Uh, so that, you know, in order to create a rotation that's either clockwise or counterclockwise, the force comes second um, geometrically. <laughs> Where am I on time? All right. Um, so with all this, uh, we are ready to write that to analyze a very, very simple system. And then I will use that to extrapolate to a more general truth. So suppose I have some mass M on a very light rod. So in this case, we're going to say that all the mass is right here, and we are going to ignore the mass of this rod. And the idea here is, suppose I start the rod, uh, you know, kind of straight up on the table. I'm going to anchor it at the table, so I'm going to always keep my thumbs here, but I'm going to allow it to rotate. But I start it off at some slight angle, and then I let it go and do what it wants. It would rotate down. In this case, you know, let's do it again. It's at some angle. If I were to let it go, it were to it rotates downward. It rotates about this rotation axis um, and then falls over on its side. In this case, we can think what's happening. Gravity is pulling down on the object, and that as a result is causing it to rotate about this point. This stick represents the moment arm where then my, my pencil represents the force of gravity. There's an overall torque as a result. And the thing rotates. So in this case, there is a gravitational force that is pulling down. There is a moment arm. You know, if I use a green dot to represent, this is the pivot or the axis of rotation. The whole, the rod plus ball is rotating about the bottom point because I was keeping it anchored. As a result, this defines the moment arm. So that would be R. And there is some angle between them. You know, I could draw them you know, base to base. Here's R. Here's F sub G. There is some angle between them. And as a result, there is also a torque that, that acts on the ball, or the ball rod system. Though again, we are ignoring any contribution from the rod, other than it allows us a way to keep it anchored along this, about this axis of rotation, so as it rotates. So we can agree that as the ball rotates downward, it undergoes an acceleration. 
initially had no velocity, it ends up moving with some non-zero velocity. There must have been some acceleration that acted on the ball as it rotated, up, constrained to rotate in a circle. You know, if it were to rotate all the way around, it would only be allowed to move in a particular circle that's defined by this rod. So I could write down that the force, um, right, the force, the component of the force that is perpendicular to the moment arm is what results in the mass of the ball undergoing some acceleration perpendicular to the moment arm. The ball is not getting closer or farther away. It is only moving in a direction that is perpendicular to this radius, to this moment arm. And it's only ever moving perpendicular. So we could think that the acceleration must only then be occurring in this um, perpendicular direction. Or at least that's the only thing that actually causes any sort of motion. So by Newton's second law, I could write that whatever that tangential component is, um, that results in the mass of the ball undergoing some perpendicular acceleration. But we just said that that is the, you know, that was used in the definition of torque. The torque on the ball was the perpendicular component, the force, the force component, so there's gravity pointing down. There's a component of gravity that points along the moment arm, which doesn't matter. There's a component of gravity that points perpendicular to the moment arm, which does matter. So it's this part, this part that is perpendicular, or 90 degrees, that, that we care about. That is exactly the force that is perpendicular um, that we're talking about here. Um, so we can, all, we can write this as that the torque divided by the moment arm equals then the mass times the resulting perpendicular acceleration. But now think to last lecture where we talked about relating linear variables and angular variables. If something is rotating in a circle and is accelerating in the circle, that means the rotation rate is speeding up. There's an angular acceleration. We saw that that was just equal to uh, the moment arm times alpha. Uh, that that linear acceleration, in this case, the acceleration that occurs when it's you know in the direction of the circular motion, is just alpha times r. So then we've ultimately written down that torque divided by the moment arm equals the mass times the moment arm times alpha. Or I can rearrange this to say that torque equals mass moment arm squared times alpha. And lo and behold, if we think of this, m times r squared, we've also seen that before. That was for a single particle, which I'm representing as this ball, that was the rotational inertia. This is nothing more than saying torque equals I omega for this ball. And this actually is Newton's second law for rotation. Or it's an instance of Newton's second law for rotation. The torque on an object results in the results in an angular acceleration, and the amount, the relationship between the two is related not by the mass, but by the rotational inertia in this case. So again, like how F equals ma, we now are writing torque equals I alpha. Again, completing the analogy that forces uh, in rotational motion, we have to think of them in terms of torques. It's torques that matter, that cause angular acceleration. Just how regular forces resulted in regular acceleration. And the relationship is through the mass. For rotation, it's related through the rotational inertia. All right, so that is where we will pick up next time, but I will write, you know, just so that I can put a box around it. I write that we can write something like Newton's second law that says the net torque 
uh, acting on an object equals the object's rotational inertia multiplied by its angular acceleration. Or that the net torque equals the rotational inertia times the object's angular acceleration. Newton's second law, but for rotation. Do, does Newton's other laws apply? Yep. An isolated object with no external torques rotates at a constant angular velocity. It's Newton's first law for rotation. Technically about a fixed axis of rotation. And then Newton's third law, two rotating objects in contact exert equal and opposite torques on each other. But next time we'll look at some examples using Newton's second law, but for torque.